going to press through. I will take very limited questions during the train because if I get into question world, it'll it'll uh, kind of spiral and I won't get through it. A lot of the questions you may have are going to be asked in the training because these are questions agents have been asking me. Um, so when I put together this training, um, I took a lot of the questions I've been getting asked by agents here in the office and uh, put them in the training. There, you know, I'm not going to cover every possible question, but let's kind of, you know, write your questions down and I will answer them um, during a question and answer session um, towards the end. Okay. Okay, <laughs> Ang uh, gusto ko lang malaman is, kapag mm. kanyan ang yun, so, ng dalawang bahay, back to back. Uh, hey, Jeanette, haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you, Jeanette. Hello, how are you doing? Good, good. Good. Uh, I'm going to be short in the meeting, but uh, I see that is recording. That would be great. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it is going to be recorded. Um, we recorded last week's session. It is on our YouTube channel. Um, but we wanted to do a second session. This is a major set of changes for people. So we want to give everyone an opportunity. Uh, and some people are coming. They enjoyed it so much the first time. They're doing it again. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get started in a couple of uh, minutes here. Oh, I have to get my water. I'll be right back. All right, let's get going because we got a lot to cover here. Um, either drop your questions in the chat or write them down. I'm going to press through a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of questions in the middle. Um, if, if I um, seem to cut you off, I'm apologizing ahead of time. Um, but if I start taking too many questions, we won't get through uh, the information. All right. Um, so, August 17th, big day. Some people think it's a big day. Some people think it's just a day of change. Hey, Arun. Um, but it just really depends on your perspective, right? So let's do the housekeeping first. 
there are documents associated with this if um, they are posted online or we'll post them afterwards. If you are doing this training and you are not a Realty One Group agent, please reach out to me directly. Um, get the information. My contact information is on the bottom of the slide. Um, and I will email you a copy of this presentation and uh, any of the other documents associated with it, okay? As I mentioned, we're taking only clarification questions during the presentation. Please put yourself on mute. It's a large group, so please put yourself on mute. Uh, remember, this is new to everyone. It's not just you. It's just not Realty One Group. It's not just... Uh, you know, people in your city. It is agents all over the state and all over the country. Everyone is starting at the same position with this. So, you know, you have to have that mindset that you're not behind, you're not not behind the eight ball or anything for that. Yeah. Related to that, but it is new to everyone. The only documents we're really going to cover here are the buyer's representation agreement, the listing agreement, and the residential purchase agreement. A couple of other associated documents I'll mention, but those are the three key documents you have to understand with this training and with this major train uh, major change going on starting August 17th. Now, there is a free video on-demand training created by CAR and what you need to do, if you have not already signed up for it, you can scan the QR code to the right. It will take you to the CAR online training store. Let me tell you, if you just go to the store, it's going to charge try and charge you $98 for the training. You have to, once you get to the store, you have to log on to your CAR account. Once you do that, it'll drop the price to $49. Follow the instructions on the checkout page, and there is a checkout code. I think it's Forms 49 or something like that. You enter that code, the price will drop to zero. So it is a free training, but they don't make it exactly easy to jump in and, and get it. So you have to follow the instructions, all right? So let's just jump into it. This is what we're gonna talk about today. Pretty much uh, covered that. So the mindset that's out there, and if you guys are on social media um, and there's a lot of talk on some of the Facebook and Instagram pages about this change, and you would think the sky is falling, right? And these are actual posts that I have taken. I think I took these from Facebook. Um, someone posted, if I were a buyer looking for a new home, I wouldn't sign Jack. Buyer's agents are screwed. Just think. Now that buyers will be paying, there won't be uh, they won't be doing inspections. My broker, my broker says that to prepare for August 17th, I need to get listings. The broker is telling them that buyers aren't going buyers agents are basically done, which is just not true and it's actually a bad mindset. But it's very easy if you have been, on social media, especially the real estate agent related pages to get into that negative mindset, that panic mindset, right? So what you're seeing out there is essentially uh, this, and this is a, a, I apologize this, and there's one other uh, short movie clip. There is some cursing in this. This is from the movie Aliens, which by the way is celebrating, I believe it's 30th birthday. Um, but this is the mindset a lot of people have. Let's see if I can get it. Well, let's see what's going on here. Well, maybe we won't play that clip because... Sorry, I'm having some technology problems here. There we go. Mm, it's not working, so we'll just move on. Hmm. 
That's interesting. Don't know why it's not working. But anyway, the mindset of people is panic. Like, oh, we're screwed now. And you have a choice. You can either take that mindset or take it as an opportunity. So Warren Buffett, uh, he's kind of the, the, many of you know, he's known as a super investor. And his whole mindset is contrarian investing. When other people are selling, you should be buying. You need to be looking for opportunities where other people aren't. That is what is going on here. As other people are wigging out, other people are panicking, you need to look at this as an opportunity to set yourself apart and really you know, educate your client base, both sellers and buyers about how you stand out from the crowd and, and uh, how you're going to help them through this transition. So it's your life is about your mindset. And for those of you who are Realty One group agents, um, and are there, how many non-Realty One group agents are on here? I know there's at least one. I will tell you that this is just our training. Uh, make sure you do what your broker tells you to do, but this is how we are approaching it. Um, but you're always welcome. We always invite non-Realty One group agents to participate in just about all of our trainings. If you're trying to grow your business, then you're welcome to join us as, as we do trainings. That's just part of our philosophy here. But anyway, um, your life is only as good as your mindset, right? And that goes for your business. If you got that negative mindset about August 17th, the sky is falling in. Guess what? The sky is going to fall in. So... It's not just about learning to do the forms correctly and everything else. It's not, uh, you know, just making sure you're checking the right boxes. The purpose of this training is one to put you in that right mindset that this is just a change, and it is. It could be an opportunity for you, and more importantly, we want to teach you how to talk to your clients. It's not just about filling out the forms. So. Let's go over the basics of what the settlement requires. So first of all, it requires that the MLS and associ affiliated associations can no longer require the seller to compensate the buyer's agent. So this was in the NAR bylaws or something, you know, and they have removed this. Now in California, it wasn't uncommon to see little to no buyer's agent compensation Sometimes you come, especially when you'd run across like auctions and things like that. But in other parts of the country, um, it is my understanding that there were literal requirements as to uh, compensation and minimum amounts. So um, that is how all of this started. All buyers must have a buyer's representation agreement. Uh, and the representation agreement must spell out the following. The duration of the agreement the location that it covers. And I'm gonna talk about that and why that's important. The maximum compensation that the buyer's agent can earn for assisting the buyer. Seller paid compensation cannot appear on the MLS. So as of August 17th, it will go away. For some MLSs, it will go away sooner. So I belong to CCAR, which is out of Walnut Creek. There, if you go to your MLS, or your association web front web page uh, website, most of them say when the change is going to affect. So for CCAR on their web page, they say it's August 12th. You will no longer have seller paid compensation on the MLS. So we're going to jump into the actual form changes, how to uh, fill out the forms. Um, we have, uh, like I said, if you want a copy of this uh, this presentation, just contact me. Uh, if you're Realty One Group staff, it will be on the face. It is on the Facebook page, right? Already from last week's. She'll, uh, we'll put it on there again after this training, and there is uh, the video will be on our YouTube. Um, if you are not Realty One, just as I said, contact me, and you can get this. So let's start with the buyer's representation agreement. Let's. So first thing to note is 
I would call the buyer's representation agreement essentially the buyer's equivalent of a listing agreement. Because you can't take a listing without that agreement and having it signed, you can't put it on the MLS. Well, now you have to have an equivalent agreement for buyers. That's what the buyer's representation agreement is. So you got to have a representation date. The most important thing about this date, uh, this period, this uh, section is the maximum for the buyer's representation agreement is 90 days. 90 days, 30 or three months. So if it expires, you have to renew it, right? It is not something you can have someone sign up for a year, you know, a year and a half, what have you, six months. Second, pardon me? No, six months, 90 day, three months, cannot exceed three months. That's the longest the agreement can be. You have to renew it every three months. If you do not have a start and end date, you do not have an uh, effective agreement, an enforceable agreement. The length is key. Second, the default is that this is a non-exclusive agreement. So if you do not check the box there, then you are saying our agreement, Mr. Buyer, is not exclusive and you can work with as many agents as you want to help you buy homes. I personally am not going to take on clients that don't do exclusive. I'm not going to spend my time. I'm not going to expend my effort and my money if you're not exclusive. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Okay. So the next thing is the property type. So why would it, so you can limit the search by a specific type of property. And why would someone want to do this? Well, say you are an investor and you have an agent that you work with regularly to find properties for you in uh, Solano County, in Fairfield, Vacaville, what have you, right? And maybe that is, um, you know, you know that's that's you have your person for that, but you also are now looking for a home in Green Valley uh, up in the Fairfield area, and you want uh, to use a different agent. Well, if you didn't specify the type of property, then you would have overlapping agents. So you can have one agent specifically looking for single family homes for you, for you and have another agent specifically looking for investment property in the same areas. Someone is not on mute. Please put yourself on mute. Uh, next thing, location. So once again, you have to specify locations. This is the requirement for the document. You are able to uh, spell out location however you would like, but um, they give you the primary options of saying cities or counties. I personally would encourage you to pick county. And if, you know, for those of you that have like more than eight minutes of experience being a realtor, you know, people change their minds. They change their mind. Oh, I absolutely positively want to be in Danville. And next thing you know, they're buying a house in Alamo, right? So I cover, I basically uh, put in the cover, the counties I cover. Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, that's where I cover. I put them all in there. That way I don't have to worry about them changing their mind. If they decide to go out to Fresno County, it's no skin off my nose because I don't work in Fresno County. But you want to make sure from an agent point of view, that your definition of the locations you're helping your client with is as broad as possible. <clears throat> okay. Properties excluded from representation. This is if they have been working with another agent in the past, when they terminated that relationship, that agent should have provided them a list of properties they assisted them in viewing or analyzing. Those properties are now excluded from properties you can get compensated for. So 
this is important. So when you talk to a new client, it is important to ask them, hey, have you worked with an agent recently? You know, and if they have, do you have a list? Did they provide you with a list of, of properties that they've helped you with? That is important. So you know not to spend your time working on properties that another agent um, has assisted them with, and especially if it's within 30, 60, 90 days. So section E1, this is your compensation area. So in the buyer's representation agreement, you have to spell out, you are required to spell out what your maximum compensation is. And I encourage you to be very thoughtful about this because if you put a low number in here, say you put 1% and the seller uh, compensation they're offering through concession is 3%, the most you can earn is that 1%, right? So I would encourage you to put a maximum amount in there. So whether it's your maximum is two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, whatever you want to put in here, you have to put in your maximum compensation because if there's any excess, especially from seller compensation, you cannot claim it. Also note here that you can put in your own compensation schedule. So for example, if you wanted to say or an advertise, hey buyers, I will uh, help you for a flat $2,500. And, you know, I will take whatever compensation the seller is offering, whether it's zero or whether it's 3%, but you pay me $2,500 upfront and I will help you for three months. You can do that. There is nothing preventing you from doing that. So the, uh, the message that's been out there that, oh, you can't, you know, Buyer's compensation is going away and all the rest of that. It's just not true. You have a lot of flexibility as to how you charge. But keep in mind, if you're going to have a separate compensation schedule, you have to have it in writing, of course, and you have to have it signed and dated by your buyer to show that they are aware of what your compensation schedule is. So keep that in mind. The other thing is your continuation period. So if for any reason, uh, you know, this agreement ends, once again, you have to provide the, uh, the buyer with a list of homes that you help them with. If they buy any of those homes within the continuation period, then you are entitled to compensation. So I typically put 90 days in here. And the reason why is I think it gives me enough time to co get covered. Most homes, most homes aren't going to still be on the market after 90 days. And secondly, after 90 days, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to remember to check. <laughs> okay. I got other things to do. I'm trying to get new business. I'm going to not going to chase people after 90 days, but it kind of gives you, uh, uh, it, it disincentivizes buyers from essentially uh, waiting or canceling your agreement and then turning around and working with someone else. Okay, so that continuation clause is very similar to what's in the listing agreement. The other thing that you have to note is cancellation of rights, non-exclusive. It says you can cancel on, is, is cancellation upon receipt of the cancellation, right? Exclusive, cancellation effective 30 days after receipt. You can write in a term into this agreement that says, hey, I will cancel our agreement upon written, uh, written uh, receipt, right? There's nothing that prevents you. The standard is 30 days canceling after receipt for exclusive. But if your client is saying, wow, you know, that kind of locks me in there for 30 days after I want to move on, just tell them, hey, I will cancel as soon as I get notice from you, right? 
And for me, if you don't want to work with me, I don't want to work with you. So I don't mind doing that. I just don't want you working with three or four agents at the same time. So with that cancellation, make sure you write in a cancel immediate cancellation clause, and I'll show you where to do that in a moment. And that's if you want to, but I think that's going to help clients feel a little bit better about doing the exclusive representation agreement. So uh, the other good thing, and one of the benefits of this change is I think there are two changes that are beneficial for agents. One is the buyer's representation agreement really can creates more of a commitment to your from your buyers than you have before. It was kind of a roll of the dice with your buyers before. Now there is an official legally enforceable agreement and you know either your buyer's in or they're out, right? The other thing is, is that they are required to provide you with that information. So sometimes you'll get buyers who are like, oh, you know, I don't want to give you my information right away. Look, if we're going to work together, you have to give me your information. And that makes sense because not only is it now that you want to make sure that they're qualified to buy a house, but you want to make sure that under the worst of circumstances, they're qualified to pay you. So that is where this information of financial info, uh, delivery of financial information and they can do that through the form BFPI. I'm not gonna go through that form. I don't know if that's a new form or not, but um, basically they can just get you your financial information. Now this next section, G2, is very important, especially if you do a lot of first time home buyers, people with limited resources, not a, a lot of extra cash. The box that the buyer can check, if your buyer's nervous and saying, hey, I don't have this money to pay you if the seller's not going to pay you. They can check this box saying buyer does not have sufficient funds to pay broker. They're telling you, I don't have the cash. I'm doing 97% financing. I'm doing 100% financing. You know, I'm getting a gift letter, uh, gift funds from, you know, my aunt or my uncle, whatever. That is very key and it should give your client uh, comfort to know that, hey, you've told me and I'm not obligating you to pay. But if they check that box, then there is uh, a way I am approaching making sure the seller understands, okay, then you have to purchase a home where there's going to be seller offered uh, compensation of buyer's agent. Okay. And then they can also let you know if they are going to use a loan product that prohibits uh, the buyer from compensating the broker. Now, it is my understanding that VA used to be this way, but they have recently announced that they will allow the buyer to compensate the broker. So VA loans, uh, it is my understanding that that is no longer the case, that there is that restriction for VA loans with this change coming up. Okay. Now, I'm going to emphasize it once again. If you if they check that box saying they're telling you they don't have sufficient funds and you don't write any other terms into your agreement and you help them buy a house, they you theoretically could be working for free and you do not escape the liability for that. Right? We people often say, you know, it's it, when you uh Hear people criticize real estate agents. Oh, you guys make so much money for what you do and all the rest of that. Well, A, they don't know what we do and how much work it is and uh, the stress involved and, you know, the uncertainty of whether, you know, you get paid or you don't get paid. There's nothing in the middle. But they also don't understand that we take on liability. So you got to make sure that if that box is checked, that you write in additional terms to make sure you get compensated. So for those of you who have worked with me before here at Realty One, ask me contract questions, you know, on just about every CAR form, my favorite section of the form is always other terms, because this gives you an op opportunity to customize your agreement with your client. 
So here's some examples of other terms you can add. add. So superseding F5, exclusive agreement is canceled upon receipt of written request. So remember the standard is for an exclusive agreement, it's 30 days after receipt. Agent has five days to deliver properties, a uh, list of properties broker has assisted with. Uh, or you could put in uh, buyers indicated in G2, which we just talked about, they do not have funds to pay broker. Buyer agrees broker is entitled to compensation and will not purchase any property where the seller does not provide compensation concessions to pay the broker. That is an example of a very important additional term or other term you need to add in if your buyer is checking that box. So what that means is you're telling your buyer, if the seller isn't paying me, you are not you agree not to buy that house. That prevents you from working for free. All right. So I cannot emphasize how important paying attention to box G2 and putting in some kind of term, especially if your buyer is doing a first time buyer, very low additional funds. It is important to protect yourself with some additional term that, that spells out what kind of property and compensation, what the source of the compensation has to be. Another example um, you could add is, hey, broker is entitled to a maximum of 3% and a minimum compensation of 2.5% of the purchase price. So you can put 3% is your compensation but if you can only get two and a half from, say, the seller, then you're willing to take that. But anything lower than that, you're not obligated to work for. You can put that in your other terms. Other terms are important. I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but it is really important. Okay. And you can add other terms. These are just some examples that I came up with but you want to make sure you are protecting yourself and getting paid. <clears throat> so this is box or section 16 on the buyer's representation agreement. It is the last page. This section, section 16 is auto filled from section, what was it, three, where you say what your compensation is. And remember, when, when you put in your compensation, it is only your compensation. There is no longer any place on the buyer's representation form, on the listing agreement, there's no place to put in, in compensation to the buyer's agent from the seller. That's all going away. So in the buyer's representation agreement, it is only your compensation as the buyer's agent. This section 16 is auto-filled from section, what was it, three, okay. I think, which is great. Now, why do they why do they put in the same information in section three and section 16? Because if you make an offer and you ask for compensation from the seller and say you ask for 3%, the seller has the right to ask for proof that the buyer's agent is entitled to that compensation. The proof comes from your buyer's representation agreement. So if they ask, you're going to send them the last page of your buyer's representation agreement with section 16 on it. Good, I have sorry. a question here, hold on just a minute. You do not send them the entire buyer's representation agreement because it may contain information that you don't want your seller to have, right? You just send them the last page of the buyer's representation agreement with section 16 on it, okay? Angela, quick question. Okay, so the question is, is if you say you work for 3%, but go down to 2.5%, 
Will that show up here? The answer is no. What you put in section three is your maximum compensation, right? If you're, and can you guys mute yourself? Please make sure you're muted. We have a lot of people online. Um, so you enter your maximum compensation. Any other change or any other you know types of agreements or sub agreements like in your other term section doesn't show up here. So if you say, hey, I'll take up the four, I, I'll take up the four, but I'll work for two and a half, that's all in your other terms or what have you. But you put that maximum amount in section three, it will show up here. And that's what you give to the seller and the seller's agent if they require or ask for proof. They have the right to ask for proof of the compensation amount. Okay, don't send them the host buyer's representation agreement. I don't want to sound like a broken record. Just send page three. Page three has the compensation amount here and it has the signatures for the buyer. So that's the residential listing uh, uh, buyer's representation agreement. I'm going to go into the listing agreement and then we're going to talk about... Oh, I don't remember what we're going to talk about. I've only done this like three or four times. <laughs> so let's talk about changes to the residential listing agreement, right? It hasn't changed much in many regards. There are a couple of major changes that we're going to talk about. One is they, you know, the typical listing period, which you're all accustomed to, but they really highlight that the maximum listing period is 24 months if the seller is, not an entity. So if it is an investor who is using an LLC or a corporation, then you do not have any limitation on the length of time that your listing can be for. But if essentially, if they're human, if your seller is quote unquote human, then it's 24 months maximum. Compensation amount. So historically, on the old listing agreements, the compensation, the first compensation box you saw in the agreement was the total compensation to both the buyer and seller. Now the amount now, of the compensation to seller's broker, only seller side of the transaction, that is only your compensation as the listing agent is what you put in here. You do not put the total compensation. Remember, putting in total compensation has pretty much disappeared from all of the forms. You must put in your compensation for assisting an uh, unrepresented buyer, right? You must tell the your your um, you must tell your client your your seller how much you're going to charge ahead of. And I think this is a change from the form. Um, I think you had to spell this out yourself in other terms. I don't think this box was here before on the old forms. I could be wrong. I don't remember it. Pardon me? Wasn't there. Yeah. Next thing is, as you go through it, there. this is um, a new form. So there is a section which is easy to overlook called the MLS and public marketing. And you just fill in, hey, what's your primary MLS, Paragon, Metrolist, Berries, whatever it is, that's fine. But now you see there is this note, car form MLSA. So on the old listing agreement, there were like two or three major paragraphs about the MLS, the benefits of the MLS. Do you wanna market on the MLS, all the rest of that. That has been pulled out of the listing agreement. It is now in this form MLSA. It is important that when you take a listing and you intend or you want to ask your client to offer compensation to the buyer's agent, you have to go to form MLSA. I'm going to explain why shortly, but pay attention to that. It is critical if you want to offer compensation compensation and you want to be able to market and discuss that with other agents right 
This allows you to advertise to other agents that there's compensation. And if you don't fill out the form, then you will be in violation of the rules. This is new. So I'm gonna go over form MLSA. Here we go. So most of it just talked about whether, you know, as the old form, do you want uh, to list it on the MLS? Do you want pictures? How much access do you want people to have? That's most of the form, but in section five, there is now uh, this section about seller authorization to discuss compensation, essentially. So remember, the default is that the seller does not allow you to discuss ahead of receiving offers compensation to the buyer's agent. That is the default. And I will also stop and say that each individual MLS may have its own rules regarding this stuff. I am just addressing the car rules, the overall statewide rules, but your MLS may have additional rules, okay? But if you do wanna be able to discuss or somehow indicate that there's compensation, then they need to check box B2 to say yes, or to somehow indicate one place or another, depending on what your MLS rule will be, that they will allow concessions. If you want a specific, to be able to discuss a specific amount of seller compensation concessions to the buyer's agent, you need to get that in writing from your client, in addition to just your regular listing agreement, and it's got to specify the amount that they are authorizing you to talk about. So you can do that in a separate document. You can do it in an addendum. You can do it on a piece of paper. I personally um, have started doing this in the other terms section of the listing agreement. I actually just took a listing and put that into the other terms. So... That is really critical. If I'm going to, certain things I'm going to repeat a lot in case you haven't gotten picked up on it. This is one of those major things. You do not want to be in violation of the new rules. That's how this lawsuit started. So make sure you fill out this form or you get this box checked 5B2 if you want to have any kind of conversation on the MLS if your MLS allows it, of fees. And I would say this is a good thing to do even if you want to advertise elsewhere. So there are no restrictions about you doing postcards with this information. There are no restrictions uh, about you. To my knowledge, there's no restrictions from you putting it on the home light disclosure documents that you may have. And but I would personally, and my strategy for myself, as I, I still do produce, is I specify that it is, they are giving me blanket ability to discuss compensation, right? You do not want to be in violation of this. Okay, third part. And like I said, if you're online, drop your questions into the chat or we'll have a, a, a question and answer session coming up shortly, but I'm pushing through because it is a lot of stuff. And I also want to get to the point, which is the more important part than just filling out the forms, is how to talk to your clients about this stuff. Uh, because that's really the key is talking to your clients and showing that you're comfortable with this. And this quite honestly is not a big deal. Okay, so we're getting into the purchase agreement. Not a whole lot of changes in the purchase agreement. I'm not going to go through the whole, whole form, just the major changes. So the real key that you have to pay attention to in the purchase agreement, and this is gonna be an area I repeat myself a couple of times, is seller concession. So on the old form, there was a box for G1, seller credit, if any, to the buyer, right? 
Additional financing term, that was on the old form. G3 is new. Seller agrees to pay obligation of buyer to compensate buyer's broker under separate agreement. SPBB, and I'll get to that form. Okay. If you are a buyer's agent and you are anticipating or require the seller to provide a concession for you to get paid. So for example, if you've got that first time home buyer that does not have additional resources and they told you on the box, they check that box saying, hey, I don't have the money to pay you. Well, when you submit an offer for them as an agent who wants to get paid, G3 has now become the most important box on this form for you. Huh? <laughs> it has become the most important box on the form as far as your compensation. If you do not check G3, you are telling the seller that you are not asking for compensation to the buyer's agent. Can I be any more clear about that? If you do not check G3, you are not asking for compensation to the buyer's agent. You're essentially telling them, hey, that's part of my offer. You have to understand now that compensation to the buyer's agent is now a negotiable thing. It's always been kind of negotiable. Now it is very negotiable. So you have to specifically ask for it just like you would ask for the refrigerator, just like you would ask for, you know, a chandelier potentially. It is another thing you have to ask for and negotiate for in the RPA. So form SPB, seller payment to buyer broker. It is actually a very short form. I know it's very rare when CAR comes out with a one-page form, but I think SPBB is one page. And it is pretty simple. This is just what this, you just fill this highlighted area in with how much you're asking for compensation. It's just that simple. And when you check G3, SPBB is automatically added to your purchase agreement as a document and you just go through and fill it out. But now this SPBB and that G box G3 for buyer's agents who like to get paid at the end of a transaction, those are the most important things on that document as far as it regards your compensation. Okay. I do not want to see any of you coming to me or Navit crying because you forgot to fill out the form. We don't want to see that. You And if it is forgotten, the seller is not obligated to renegotiate with you to get you paid. So please do not forget this. I know I'm doing that broken record thing again, but this is really important to you as an agent. So I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna take a few questions and then we're gonna talk about the more important aspect is to how to communicate to your clients about all of this change. Let's see how I'm doing on time. I am doing better than I did last week. It isn't even noon yet. So let me look at questions. Julie, I have listing going on the market tomorrow. So it's okay on the flyers that the seller is offering 2% buyer's compensation. Yes, so it is okay to put on flyers um, that the compensation is 2%. What I would do, Julie, as, as I noted, is make sure you're, you've done the listing on the new listing agreement. And I'm gonna talk about what happens if you have an existing listing right now. Um, so, uh, but what I would do is on the new listing agreement under the other terms and on box MLSA and on form MLSA, I would check, make sure they check the box and I would put in writing that 
you know, they're offering 2% and they, op they authorize you to market that. And I get that in writing and they need to sign and date it. All right, Julie. Uh, next, Michelle, if G318 is not checked and the seller is compensating the buyer broker addendum does not suffice. You need an AEA. I don't know what AEA is off the top of my head, but that is correct. Yeah, basically, and I'm, I'm going to say it again, you have to get box G3 checked if you're a buyer's agent and want to get paid from the seller. You're just going to make your life miserable if you don't do it. It's, do not count on being able to go back and renegotiate that. Amendment of existing agreement. Thank you. I forgot what that was. There are a ton of new forms, but we're just talking about the major ones here. That is correct. If you forget to get that box checked, you have to hope that the seller will renegotiate with you. If not, you're working for free and taking on the liability. So let me scroll and see if there are any other questions online. I don't see any other in the chat. Anyone have questions they want to ask me online here in the group? Yes, sir. So, the question is, is if the if the seller states in initially that uh, I'm I'm just making up numbers here that yes I will pay two percent to the buyer's agent if you know and I'm anticipating a price of a million dollars but the actual price is um, seven hundred fifty thousand and now they don't want to pay the two percent so. Part of that is, to my knowledge, the seller is not obligated to do that. They're offering, they're making an offer, but until you have a contract, it's not enforceable. So if they want to renege on that, then the buyer can say, well, I'm not going to give the offer because I made this offer based on your advertising, right? So until you have an agreement in writing, you don't have an agreement. But what I would also tell you is once that, assist, that occurs, I would tell your seller, hey, I'm gonna communicate that to get the 2%, the minimum price I need is a million, right? You can do that. There's nothing that prevents you from, you and your seller from saying, hey, uh, I think my place is worth a million. I'll pay two and a half for a million. But if I only get 750, I'm only going to pay one and a half. And if I get one and a half, I'll pay three. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that. Just put it in writing, get it signed, and get it dated. Let me see if there are other questions here. No, nothing else in the chat. So I'm going to take a drink. No, the listings have been tagged right now. So they don't, I don't need those uh, uh, sellers to compensate us, right? That's already in the store. So the question is do, I, do you have to worry about all of this if you have an existing listing? I'm going to cover that in a little while. Okay. I'm going to cover what, what to do if you have existing buyers and existing listings shortly. So I'm going to come back to that question. So let's talk about how to, co to communicate with people because to me, this is the bigger part of all of this change. Um, make sure everyone's on mute. So as a buyer's agent, this is a change because people are being, as buyers are being made very aware of your compensation now. Previously, buyers, a lot of buyers didn't have a clue of what your compensation was or where it came from sometimes. I'd say most buyers knew that the seller was compensating the agent. They usually had no clue as how much you were getting compensated. 
So with this change, and now that they have to sign the buyer's representation agreement and they know what they what you are earning, then that means you have to be able to articulate your value. If you don't know your value and you can't articulate it, I think you're going to struggle. Second, you are not at a disadvantage compared to the market, right? It is not just Realty One Group agents that are going through this. It's not just, oh, Realty One Group decided to do this. No, EXP, Keller people, Compass people, everyone is going through this. So get it in your mindset that you're not at a disadvantage. You've got to figure out how to turn this into an advantage for you. All agents are playing by the same rules, right? That just gets to the to what I was just talking about. So what I would do is I think you need to have a presentation like you do for uh, your listing presentation, right? This is something I've started to do with buyers. I actually use this um, these three headlines. I just went on to Google and found these headlines. Most people, I'd say about half the people have heard about this that I, I've talked to and half have not. And if they have questions about it, I just want to say, hey, it, it's been in the news. This is this was pretty big stuff. It was in U.S. News. Uh, I forgot. It was in CNN. It was on Real Estate News. It's a pretty big thing. If you're going to do this, I encourage you to pick headlines that make sense from your perspective. So uh, there were headlines I saw that said end of the of real estate commission or end of the 6% commission. Uh, or stuff like uh, essentially saying, you know, abusive real estate fees going away. You don't want to pick headlines like that, right? It's kind of negative. You just want to pick more, hey, here's a change type of headline. I would have this in like a buyer's presentation um, um, package that I created. Uh, the other thing is, let me take a step back and talk about how to present this or when to present this, especially the buyer's representation agreement. In general, my feeling, how I'm approaching this is if you make this a big deal, then your client is going to see it as a big deal. If you're nervous talking about it, then you're gonna make your client nervous. If you think, oh, wow, how are them gonna get them to accept two and a half percent? They're gonna balk on it. Then <clears throat> chances are they're gonna pick that up and they're gonna balk on it. You have to show your value and make this a matter of fact thing when you are presenting it. You And that gets back to knowing your value. The way I have gone about doing this, I've started doing the buyer's representation agreements, is I still go through the, my same old process. Hi, Mr. Buyer. You know, what's motivating you to buy right now? What are you worried about? What are your requirements? What's your time frame? Who are the decision makers? You know, tell me everything you, you want to tell me about this whole process. What's important to you? I don't even bring this up until I've really established that connection, right? That doesn't change. You go through your entire rapport building, building process. Then after you've gotten the rapport, You've gotten their agreement. Yes, I want to proceed. What's what do we do next? Tell me, you know, can we go and look houses this weekend? Okay, Mr. Buyer, here are the next steps. I start with let's go and see your pre-approval. If you don't have one, let me help you get pre-approved. If you got it from some random online place, here's why you don't want to use Rocket Mortgage that gave you a 30-second approval online. I start with the mortgage and the financing because quite honestly, that's usually the most important thing. Second thing I talk about, okay, as a result of this, you know, changes, we have to sign a buyer's representation agreement. I just go through it. I don't make a big deal out of it. It is just another document we need to sign, right? If they start to have questions, then I need to have my answers and I need to be able to show my value, which I'm going to continue with in a moment. But as far as how I'm integrating this into my conversations with buyers, it is 
after my rapport building and it is the second part of my next steps. It is not how I start the conversation. The other thing to remember is people may balk because this is new. You cannot show houses without a buyer's representation agreement. That's the rule now. And I'm gonna talk about people who say, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna go somewhere else. I'm gonna work with the listing agent. I'm gonna show you, talk about that momentarily. This is not an exception. This is not optional. So when they say they're going to go with someone who isn't gonna require them to do that, that's gonna be very hard. And I'll talk about how to handle that objection in a moment. But I have these headlines so I can show people this just isn't me making this up. There's something major that's going on. Next, I'm, I'm, I've am i created or in the process of creating a service comparison chart. I like to do these type of things. I start doing this on the listing side to show how my services vary from the typical air agent or Redfin. And it works well for me on the, the, the listing side. So I start, I'm gonna do this on the buyer side. What does the typical agent do? Well, home search, I'll just set you up on the MLS. Well, me, I will set you up on homes.com or and real scout. Um, and then we can interact. It's much more custom than just the standard MLS. Oh, and by the way, if you know a specific neighborhood you want to be in, I'll proactively look for off-market properties for you. I will go out of my way and take money out of my pocket and invest in finding you a home. The typical agent does not do that. Mortgage pre-approval will tell you to get a mortgage pre-approved. I am always astounded when agents just tell people, okay, go get a pre-approval from whatever bank. It happens. Like, I, I'm just astounded. They may recommend one lender. Um, I work with a number of mortgage providers. I have my preferred providers, but hey, depending on what your situation is, I might recommend two or three. If you need 100% financing, uh, we have a provider that does that. It's here in office, model mortgage, right? Um, I recently did a transaction where someone wanted to do 10% uh, jumbo financing for a $2.2 million house. That's very hard to do 10% jumbo. I have a lender that will do that. Standard pricing, no, no unusual. So you have to make sure you can articulate why you are better. Even though you may not be a mortgage expert, you still need to know and you can offer them more options than, than oh, you know, just go to B of A or, you know, whoever online. So I would create some type of buyer service comparison where you can make yourself stand out compared to the typical agent, what they're going to get for the fee that you're charging them. The other thing I do is the disclosures. So um, I've had clients tell me, uh, experienced home buyers tell me when they work with me, I have never had anyone help summarize the disclosures for me because most agents will just email you the link, tell you to review them, and then ask them questions if you have questions. 95% of people are snowed over by the disclosures. That's like if I had a question about insurance, my insurance agent sent me all the documentation, told me to read it over and ask them if I have questions. I don't know what I'm reading. Most people don't know what they're reading for real estate, right? And if they do, it's going to take them a long time to get through it because they don't know what they're looking for, whereas we do. I started doing this. I created this form. I and I will go through the major documents and tell them, hey, these are the items that I saw that are of greatest note and if applicable, what the estimated cost is. But if you're going to do this kind of form, I think it's great because it differentiates you. It tells the client that you're going to help them out, but you have to have a disclaimer. You don't want people to just say, oh, I used Rich's summary and I didn't read forms and he didn't tell me something and I'm gonna sue them. So my disclaimer, I said, hey, this is just my summary. I'm trying to make it simple for you, but you need to go and read the actual forms, the disclosures, the reports yourself, they, and you should rely on those forms as opposed to this summary. 
you need to have a disclaimer if you're going to offer this type of document. Okay. If you want a copy of this, I will send it to you. So as I always tell the Realty One group folks, uh, anything I do, this form, any other form, any of uh, marketing I do, if I share it in a training, then it is available to anyone, uh, whether you're with Realty One or not. If you're trying to improve your business, we're all for that. That's all we care about. So just reach out to me if you want a copy of this that you can change for yourself. Okay. How does it succeed? Buyer's agent. What if buyer doesn't want to sign a rep representation and they say they're going to work with an agent that doesn't require it? Well, okay. First of all, all agents are supposed to do it. So it's going to be pretty hard to find an agent that doesn't require it now. And here at Realty One, we are going to be looking at your BRBC forms. It, it is, this is not something that you can just fill out with the rest of the disclosures. We will be looking for the date, right? You have to have it before you show any homes. And if you don't, you don't have an agreement. That client can turn around and buy it with another agent because you don't have a BRBC. There's also a shorter form, which I'm gonna talk about more momentarily if they don't wanna do the full BRBC. But it's going to be hard to find an agent. And if you do find an agent that is willing to sell you homes without the agreement, then you have just found an agent that is breaking the legally required process. And if they're not gonna follow the legally required process now and they're cutting corners, can you trust them not to cut corners on your transaction? That's gotta be your response. If you wanna work with someone who's gonna cut corners for you, that's fine, good luck because they're going to cut corners to get your deal done and it may not be done right. And you're spending a million and a half dollars. Okay. I'll just work with directly with the listing agent. Sure, you can work with the listing agent, but you have to understand a couple of things about going to the listing agent. One, they're going to charge you even if you go to the listing agent. Why? Because they are now doing the work to help you purchase the home. And more importantly, they are taking on the legal liability. So you're unlikely to save much money by going to the listing agent. Second, and this may be even worse for you, Mr. Buyer, by going to the seller's agent, they are literally just helping you fill out the forms and complete the transaction. They are not advocating for you. They are not going to negotiate the price down for you. They are not going to tell you, should you ask for credits or repairs? because their obligation is to serve the seller. They are literally just going to help you essentially do the paperwork to get this transaction done. So if you want to pay the seller not to work for you, that's fine. That's your choice. Very few people will take that choice. But you have to be able to articulate this and you have to be able to respond to it immediately. You can't go, uh, well, oh, um, you've got to have this in your mind and you've got to be able to respond to it immediately. I don't want to be committed to working with you just when we just met, given we just met. This is reasonable, that's understandable. There is a representation agreement that allows you to see up to three properties over a 30 day period to see if the fit is mutual, things work well together. And I don't know, I don't remember the name of that form offhand. I might have that later in the presentation, but it is a, essentially a mini buyer's representation agreement. Still has the compensation amount in there and so on, but it is for a maximum of three properties that can be seen over a maximum of 30 days. The buyer's representation agreement is unlimited properties over 90 days. If after that introductory period, we like each other, and that's a key thing, in my view, you have to set it that you're kind of interviewing each other. Not that, oh, if you, you're so kind to take me on, let me be your agent. No. Hey, if we work well mutually together, I'll be excited to, to do uh, a, an agreement. You, that's part of showing your, your value. 
you have to make them say feel like, hey, they're lucky you're taking them up. So make things, your statements here, mutual. Not that you're subservient to them. It is required, all realtors have a written relationship, right? Just getting back to that last slide. You have to have a written relationship. Okay, my client doesn't have the funds to pay me. We talked a little bit about this. This is often the case with uh, first time home buyers. They might just have very limited funds, a lot of home buyers. And that really gets to the point where you have to spell out um, that it is important that the seller provide concession funds for your compensation. If you do not spell that out and they tell you they do not have the money, I'll get back to it again, you will be working for free and taking on liability. All right? So you need to put something, if they check that box, broken record time, you need to put something in your agreement that says they agree to buy a house that offers seller's compensation, concession and compensation fee. So now let's talk about communicating with sellers. He's educating sellers on the um, why they should offer compensation to their buyers. One, they're likely to net more money from the sale. And two, they're likely to sell their property, property significantly faster. Basically, it's, it's more money and less time for you, Mr. Seller. You have to help people understand the bigger picture. Sometimes people get so focused on, oh, I'm going to save this five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, and it costs them thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And I'm going to show you why. Sellers are still subject to market forces and competition. So sellers, some feel like they're in control. I can do whatever I want. Well, yeah, you don't have to pay. There's nothing that requires you to pay, but there's no nothing that requires a buyer to buy your house under the terms you set. You are still competing for buyers. And especially in, in many markets, if you're not offering compensation, your house is likely to sit. So I would tell my seller, hey, you're never obligated to pay, but there are two reasons that it is to your financial benefit. Number one, seller may net more from the sell. So I'm going to give you an example here. We'll say the buyer has $100,000 total for their home expenses. I'm going to keep their home expenses simple. I'm not going to do closing costs and all the rest of that. We'll say their expenses are down payment and paying their agent. They have $100,000 for all those expenses. They are approved for 80-20 financing. That means for every $1 they put in as a down payment, the bank gives them $4, right? So there are two options that could happen. Say the seller is absolutely insistent that the buyer pay their agent directly. Okay, I really love the house, I'll pay my agent. I will absolutely pay my agent. That's fine, Mr. Seller. I will pay them $10,000. But now, that buyer only has $90,000. So now they only have $90,000 for down payment because they took $10,000 and paid their agent or will take $10,000 and pay their agent. For the four, for every one, $4 for every one that this buyer puts in, that means the bank will now give them a loan of $360,000. You add 90000 to three sixty, you get four fifty. That's the maximum amount they can afford. And one of the keys when you're having this discussion to a seller, with the seller in most markets, is to get agreement that, hey, you know, most people, when they buy a house, they have a set budget for all of their home buying expenses. Before you even get into that, you need to get agreement from your seller that that's the case. They think, nope, they can pull, you know, people can pull an extra 50000 from anywhere. Then this is going to be hard to get them to understand this. So start, hey, you know, when you bought a house, your first house, you know, you probably had a limited budget for all of your house buying expenses, right? I mean, would you agree that's the case for most people? 
get that agreement and then go into the scenario. So your maximum home purchase is 450 under this scenario. Scenario B, they agree, the seller agrees to pay the 10,000 out of their proceeds. Now the buyer has a full $100,000 for their down payment. Well, now the bank will give them $4 for every $1 they put down. That means they'll give them a loan of $400,000. What's the maximum price of the home they cannot afford? 500,000, the 100,000 plus the 400,000. So by agreeing to pay 10,000 from their proceeds at sale, they can now get a maximum purchase price of $50,000 more. So they net $40,000 more theoretically because they paid $10,000. And this only this this leverage effect is only more telling or more obvious if someone's doing like 90 10 financing so for every one dollar you take out of the buyer's pocket they lose nine dollars in financing i mean that really becomes sorry okay so it, you are bringing more buyers than can afford to buy your five hundred thousand dollar home if you pay ten thousand dollars for the commission and, you know, I just made up simple numbers here, but it, it applies basically for any type of uh, situation. The second reason is your home is likely to sell significantly faster. So people as sellers have to remember that most people are, most people are still going to have a mortgage, right? So even if you bought a new home, you're out of it, no one's in it. You're still paying that mortgage. You still got to pay an HOA if that's uh, applicable. You still got to pay property tax. You still have to keep homeowners insurance. It's costing you money to keep this house, right? And if you are still in the house, you can't move on until you sell it. Your life is on hold, basically. Whatever your next transition or phase in life is on hold. So... When a, when a group of buyers look at home, say home A and home B are on the same street, they're the same model and they're across the street from each other. Home A is insistent that the buyer pay their agent for the seller. Home B is having the seller pay the buyer's agent. Well, where do you think the buyers are gonna to choose to go? They're gonna to go to home B because that's in their best interest. They don't care about saving you $10,000, Mr. Seller. It's in their best financial interest to try and get home B. So you have to help sellers understand that it's not just all about them. It's not all about what they want and putting more money in their pocket. If they offer a less desirable option to buyers, Buyers will go to sellers offering a better deal for them, the buyer. All right. So I'm going to stop again, see if there's some questions. Chat seems kind of quiet. Hopefully I haven't put people into a coma. Any questions online? You can put them in the chat or you can just ask me. Maddie, Madeline, thank you. You're good, Rich. Oh, that's that's very nice. I appreciate it. Any questions? So let's go through some questions. I'll just go, oops, let me close the chat here. I have an existing listing. Do I need to redo my listing? You have two options if you have an existing listing. So, you must implement one of these two options by August 17th. You can either complete a, an updated residential listing agreement with your seller. That's the preferred option. Or there is a form called a dedicated modification of listing agreement, DMLA. You need to complete that form. But just having your existing listing agreement after August 17th will not be acceptable. 
How am I doing on time? I am whipping through it. Okay, chat. I'm going to stop and see if there's a chat question. Okay, Kang. So this is from Kang. Uh, for buyer broker agreement, do you suggest we fill that fill out that uh, in front of the client or via DocuSign? So I will, in my opinion, it depends on the relationship you have with people, right? Um, so if you get a referral from, say, a close friend, and this is another close friend of theirs, and they've talked you up and they're ready to go, then doing it over the phone, if you haven't met, might not be a big deal. But if not, I would probably have a phone conversation with them, set in motion all of this stuff and as you have that phone conversation in your next steps say hey if you're ready to proceed in your next steps we have to do a buyer's representation agreement here's what's going to be in the agreement i'm going to send it to you via docusign if you feel they're wavering on it then set up that meeting and try and get them to sign it in person but remember you cannot show homes without some kind of agreement do not skip this step Okay, um, Lynette, so if negotiating buyer agent commissions, is that with buyer or directly with agent? Oh, so when, so it's based, you're still doing everything through the seller's agent, right? You're not going, oh, as a seller. Oh, so if you're a seller and you, your agent may recommend that you offer compensation, but through that, Session, you are not obligated to offer a conversation. It is case by case. You could get one person who submits an offer asking for 3% and you can get another offer asking for 0% in compensation to the buyer's agent. You're free to take the one at zero, even though you offer offered 3%, right? So the negotiation is really now between the buyer and the seller. It is not one agent compensating another, okay? And that, thanks for the question. Oh, another question. Diana, timeline. Let's say when we connect by phone, we have conversation that the first uh, pre, uh, first step pre-approve, should we wait to get the buyer representation signed the day before the first house tour we start connecting before we start connecting them. So, okay, so basically it's just a timeline question. I, I appreciate that, Diane. So uh, what I am doing is it's like a listing. Even though they're ready to, you know, they may not be ready for a while, I'm trying to get them signed as soon as possible. So even if they're not pre-approved or, you know, oh, well, we're gonna start looking in two or three weeks, a month, whatever, I'm still gonna sign you today. I can do a renewal, that's much easier to do in three months, but I'm not going to wait. So my suggestion is to get them to sign as soon as possible. All right, Diane? New message, thank you, you're welcome. Um, okay, so oh, let me get back to this. Okay, so if, if seller authorizes promotion of seller concessions as required, um, as required of in, of in, I was typing late. I don't know how I missed that. MLSA, can I post the information on the MLS? So according to CAR, they allow this if you follow all the requirements on form MLSA. But the reality is you have to understand the rules of your specific MLS. If your MLS says you can't do it, so like CAR, uh, CCAR, the, my MLS, they are going to allow you to be able to indicate that there is a concession available, but they will not allow you to post the amount. Your MLS may be different. Your MLS may outlaw it completely. You have to know the rules of your MLS. What if I've already been working with a buyer? Do I need to have a representation agreement? Yes. No exceptions starting August 17th. If you want to get paid, you need an, a representation agreement. So I'd start talking to your clients now. I have started talking to clients about this. 
Okay. I am already in contract. Escrow, do I need a BRBC or new listing agreement? No. As long as you're in contract before August 17th, you do not need to do this new stuff. However, if you are just listing, if you are negotiating past August 17th, you have to do this. So if you're basically, if you're not in contract by the end of this week, I would make sure I get my forms done because chances are you're not going to be in contract by the 17th. What if I forget to request seller concession for buyer's agent compensation on RPA? Will I still get paid? We kind of talked about that. It depends, but I will tell you it's probably unlikely. Seller paid buyer agent compensation is negotiable now. It is negotiable from transaction to transaction. So if the seller tells you, hey, I picked your offer because you didn't ask for compensation. So I'm not going to change it now. They are not required to renegotiate with you. So that is why I was harping on the importance of filling in that box when you're submitting uh, compensation, uh, submitting your offer. One other thing I will tell you, and this is another mindset thing, is there's been a lot of talk, especially online, the social media of, oh, I have to ask if they're offering compensation and what if they're not, and then I can't make an offer on, on that property. Everything's negotiable now, right? So I don't care personally if the seller tells me I'm offering zero. If your client wants to make an offer on that house, make that offer on the house. I tell the agent, I'm going to ask for compensation. You're free to turn it down. But it's negotiable. Your client should ask for it. Even like if someone says in their listing, the refrigerator goes with us, and your client says, I want to make an offer for the refrigerator included. There's nothing stopping you doing that. So even if someone says, I'm not making compensation agreements, well, if you're making a really strong offer, but you want compensation concessions, ask for it. It's negotiable now. Don't be passive as a buyer agent, especially when you get into situations where you see that that listing, because probably they're not offering compensation, has been sitting there for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Be proactive. Get your client into the house. The other thing is, you know, I personally believe that in most areas, they're going to have to offer compensation to get their home sold. Now, if you are selling in Ruby Hill and Pleasanton, maybe you don't have to offer compensation. If you are selling in Palo Alto, Woodside, Piedmont, very high-end areas, you may not have to offer compensation as to the uh, buyer's agent as a seller. And most of the buyers in that area, if someone said, hey, you need to come up with an extra $30,000, if you're buying in Palo Alto, an extra $30,000 probably is not going to blow you out of the water. Probably. But if you are buying your first home in Fairfield and someone says you have to come up with an extra $15,000 or $10,000, that will probably buy, blow you out of the water. And to be honest, that is most of the areas in the Bay Area, even some pretty relatively higher end areas. I would... Anticipate in areas even like Martinez, Pleasant Hill, Walnut Creek, maybe even San Ramon and Dublin and Pleasanton to an extent, but you may get exceptions in very popular areas, but the majority is still going to require buyer's concession. Got to make sure if you do make this mistake, does your buyer have funds to pay you? If they check that box, they do not. You're kind of out of luck. <clears throat> if you do do the, the transaction and you don't get paid, guess what? You still have to pay fees. We take on liability. The office takes on liability for that transaction. So thus, we will still charge you for the transaction, even if you don't get paid from the transaction. So please, 
please make sure you check that box on your uh, offer. Do not make this mistake. Okay, this is a question I have gotten a lot. So I heard open house visitors, visitors are now required to sign in during open house visits. Is this true? Yes and no. So there is a new form. Yes, just when we need another form. It is called the open house non-agency and sign in uh, that allows people to sign in. It is a form with a paragraph on top and like eight sign-in slots below, seven or eight slots. <laughs> people do not have to sign in. However, we are recommending to people that if they choose not to sign in, that you limit your questions to non real estate specific <clears throat> your information and non real estate specific information sorry time for a drink so you can answer how far is the bar station from here does this condo come with parking yeah i can tell you that stuff that's just kind of factual stuff but anything that it could be considered real estate advice you should not answer during an open house if they do not sell this form, sign this form, because you are opening yourself up to providing real estate um, advice, essentially, without having an agreement. So if they ask you, hey, do you think the price of homes will soften? Or how do I get pre-approved for a mortgage? Or can you recommend someone to pre-approve me for a mortgage? I would tell you, you need them to sign because you are now giving them advice and you do not have an agreement saying, hey, I'm not, you visiting and we talking does not create an agency relationship. They don't sign this form that could theoretically put you at risk. Avoid saying anything that might be considered real estate advice if they don't sign. Yeah. And uh, there is a the 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 so this form is if you are the listing agent or hosting the open house for a listing agent and people are, are visiting, you need to have visitors who are not with their agent sign this form. So the question is, and tell, tell me if I'm wrong, Arun, is how do you work with this if they have an agent and they're coming to the open house, correct? Right? So your question was, how do you, is this form necessary or do they need to sign it if they're coming to your open house and have an agent? Is that correct? Yes. yes. Even if they have an agent, if they show up without their agent, they need to sign this form or I would advise you not to give them real estate related advice. So you may want to have forms there. You may want to have additional BRBC forms or short-term representation forms. I forget what the form is called. Maybe I have it here somewhere. So if someone wants to say, hey, can you show me this house across the street? They sign the short-term representation form. Do you have an agent? No. Okay, we'll sign the form. If they do have an agent, then no, you have to work with your agent to see that house, I'm sorry. But this form is if you are hosting an open house or a listing, and you have visitors, you want to be able to answer all of their questions, but you don't want to open yourself up to liability. Okay? So, Layla. So the question is, and this is a good question. If you, if some, if your client asks you to show homes and, um, 
you're not available for whatever reason and someone fills in for you, is that allowed anymore? I'm going to tell you, I don't know. What I'm going to say is it is allowed, but I would just put it in writing that, you know, in an email or whatever that this agent is going to cover for me today. Please, you know, direct any questions or advice to me and not the agent. They're just essentially giving you access. But technically, I don't know. So that's a question I need to get an answer for you. Is there another question back here? Statement. Good. I tried out the form this weekend, and actually, people were very open to it. They understood why and how, and that when there's a, why I can and can't answer their questions, and they signed their Okay. So the, the statement was from Angela that she, because she's being proactive, started using this form, hosting an open house this weekend. Um, and in doing so, she didn't have any problem getting people to sign it and they understood why. Okay. Let me see. There's another question in the chat. King, can I put seller compensation amount everywhere except the MLS with seller authorization? Yes. As long as it is not uh, in the MLS, depending on what your specific MLS rules are. And another thing to, to consider is now in the Bay Area, there are multiple MLSs that are tied together. So the Santa Clara, the Contra Costa Alameda, the San Francisco, they're all tied together, right? And they may have slightly different rules. How are you supposed to navigate the different rules? What I would tell you is follow the rules of the MLS you belong to don't worry how the information gets disseminated to the other MLSs, okay? Just follow the rules of your MLS and let the MLSs figure out the dissemination of the information. Okay, getting back to questions. Oops. What happens if I don't have a BRBC form before showing the house or making an offer? Well, this isn't going to happen because people attending this class know you can't show houses without a representation form. But we're all human. We make mistakes. But you must get in the habit of getting doing a BRBC before taking clients to view properties. As I said, in this office, we are going to start looking at your BRBC forms for dates. Do not put in, don't get them signed when you're getting the disclosure signed right? This is like a listing agreement. You need this to start the process. Get your BRBC signed. We will be checking on going in the future. Uh, you got to remember, if we're audited or sued, if the, the DRE comes in here or someone sues us, what's the first thing they're going to look for? The BRBC. That's why we're going to be checking it. So it, to cover yourself, to cover everyone involved, to make sure you get paid, especially to make sure you get paid, you need a BRBC form before you take someone to see a house. You take someone to see a house, they love it, you don't have a BRBC, they can go to their their uh, brother Fred who lives in Sacramento and have them write up the contract for them, right? This is to protect you as much as protect them. This is your equivalent of a listing agreement. Get it done. So that is it. I'm going to take some more questions. One thing I did want to point out is the CCAR has got has created some uh, one-page PDFs. So they have one called Buy, What to Do If Your Buyer's Broker Posts MLS Changes. If you scan that QR code, you'll get the PDF. Listing Brokers, What to Do Post MLS Changes. You scan that QR code, you'll get the PDF. Buyer's broker during the transition period, so from now through Jan uh, August 17th and thereafter, shortly thereafter, there's a PDF for that. Here's a scan. What it, should I do if I'm a listing broker during the transition? And that you will get the PDF. I see there's a question there. Once again, I'm going to highly encourage you 
to take the on-demand video training CAR offers. It takes a little over two hours, maybe two and a half hours to get through. I'm sorry, you cannot fast forward through this training. It does not allow you to pay, play it at 125 or 150%, which is how I usually watch YouTube videos. Um, and you cannot skip ahead in the training. It, you got to go through it sequentially. You got to go through it at the normal speed. Once you get through it, it'll let you have more flexibility how to play back and things like that. Please take the time to watch it. I am not covering all the form changes. I did not cover every detail. These form changes and these, these changes overall impact how you make your living. Find the two hours to do it. For people on this call who are Realty One Group um, agents, I and Nabit will definitely help you out. We will answer your questions. But if you are not um, indicating that you've done the online training, I am going to ask to see your certificate because when you finish the training online, they give you a certificate. I want to see, I'm going to answer your questions, but I also want to see that you're making the investment in your own career to spend the time to learn how to make sure you get paid and how you make sure you represent your client in a legal manner. Okay. So feel free to call, call me. I don't want to tell you, you can't call me, but you have a responsibility to make sure you understand what this change means to you, what these changes mean to you. Pardon me? Yeah, if you scan this, it will do a two-hour video on-demand training. Please follow the instructions so you don't end up paying for it. It is free. It is free, but you have to follow the instructions or else they're going to try and charge you. Okay, other questions. I see there's a question here in the chat. DocuSign BRBC or hard copy? How do we turn into ROG? So if you um, if you DocuSign it, that's fine. You just email it like anything else. If you get it hard signed, what I if you get uh, wet signatures as they're known as real signatures on paper, I actually um, I actually have an app on my phone that when I take pictures, it turns it into a PDF. Um, it's free. I would keep that and just turn things into PDF. I would then email that to your um, TC or whoever you're using, and they will start a SkySwift file for you. So, and if that's not the case, you know, you can scan it and just email it into the office. We don't really need the BRCC until you are in contract. So you don't have to send it to us for everybody that you possibly work with because that will become overwhelming for us. But when you get that BRBC, you need to keep your own records of having that document. And when you get into contracts, send it to us so we know. All right. Kenna, thanks for coming by. We're going to try and get you here with the Realty One Group family, okay? Um, any other questions? Any other questions here from the uh, people in person? I think we have some food over here. I'm not 100% sure. In the conference room. And I also, oh, Cheryl, you're going to the restroom. I don't want to interrupt you. So that's okay. I just want to briefly, for people who have not met Cheryl, come on, Cheryl. Hello. Well, Cheryl is our new office manager. So she is here Monday through Fridays. She is a uh, joy to be around. So please uh, come by, meet her, and I will let her go now. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank and, you for the lovely training. Um, so if you have questions, my contact information is at the bottom of the slide. For Realty One Group future attendees, this information is already in our Facebook group. You can see it. Layla will also repost this presentation so you can get a copy of it um, and see all of the stuff in this presentation. If you are not a Realty One group person, you can just email me and I will send you whatever you know materials that were presented here. Okay.
Thanks, everybody. What time did I do this in? Thanks, oh, Rich. Two minutes early. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for participating, everybody. Have a good day.